Nevada has become something of a magnet for UFO enthusiasts ever since stories about government testing of flying saucers were broadcast. Much of the information about the alleged testing program is from Bob Lazar, a former government scientist whose background has been the subject of intense scrutiny both from inside and outside the UFO field. Tonight in part two of our series, UFOs, the best evidence, George Knapp takes a look at some of the questions raised about Lazar and his claims. Business isn't booming at the Rachel Bar and Grill, but proprietors Joe and Pat Travis have few complaints. They're expanding now into a second trailer, thanks to the patronage of a few dozen locals and a steady stream of UFO buffs drawn by reports of flying discs on the other side of the Groom Mountains. I, I think most people that come up here come up for the enjoyment just to get away from the hassles and uh, the city, just to get out and to do something different, and this is uh, something different to do. Yeah. UFOs have become so synonymous with Rachel that a flying saucer was included on posters advertising the annual town celebration. Likenesses of ETs adorn the walls of the bar, and Joe Travis is even talking about renaming the place. The Alien. Yeah, yeah the Alien. You know, we're gonna have we're gonna have real nice drinks. You know, like the Transporter. Uh, <laughs> no, beam me up. <laughs> like that. It may be self-serving, but the Travises insist that plenty of folks actually see the flying saucers. On any given night, numerous headlights slice through the darkness outside Area 51. The curious are routinely monitored by omnipresent security forces, both in the desert and in the bar. If there are any that are kind of acting a little bit strange, I know about it, and so do they. You mean the people over there come over here to see if people are still coming up here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If Rachel was big enough to have a mayor, Bob Lazar could probably be elected. His statements about government activities inside the test range are largely responsible for the influx of visitors. Lazar says he was hired by the United States Navy to work in an ultra-secret facility, dubbed S-4, approximately 10 miles south of Area 51. S-4 sits adjacent to the dry bed of Papoose Lake, Lazar says, and is built to blend in with the desert. According to Lazar, S-4 is home to at least nine flying disks of alien origin. The craft are powered by antimatter reactors, propelled by anti-gravity generators. The fuel is a heavy element called 115, he says, and the mission of those who work at S-4 is to master and duplicate the alien technology using Earth materials and know-how. He believes the technology is extraterrestrial for several reasons. One, because the machines do things that are beyond Earth technology. Two, because of the telltale small furniture inside the flying disks. And three, because of briefing papers he says he read at S4. There were autopsy reports. I mean, I didn't look, completely read them, uh, because I didn't have time. And as soon as I got into some interesting things, I wanted to get through these really quickly, because I know I didn't have much time. Uh, basically, I looked at the pictures in them. To save time. <laughs> and there were pictures of what? A dead alien. I mean, how do you know they're aliens? What, what do they look like? The, uh, I guess the typical gray, if anyone knows what that is, the three and a half, four foot tall, uh, smooth, head, large, smooth, large head. Uh, what, they, they had uh, their organs laying out or what? Yeah, their organs. Some of them, the organs were bisected, taken apart. There were drawings associated with the organs. Uh, the bodies were all cut up. I didn't see a picture of uh, a live, seemed like, well-being. Barring a full confession by the government, which seems highly unlikely, it may be near impossible to prove what Lazar says. It's tough enough proving anything about him. The schools he says he attended say they still have no records of his enrollment. Los Alamos National Lab, where he says he was employed as a physicist, has consistently denied that Lazar ever worked there. When Los Alamos was confronted with a 1982 lab phone book containing Lazar's name, officials came up with a different story. They now say Lazar worked briefly for a lab subcontractor in a non-sensitive position. After numerous inquiries over several months, however, neither the lab nor the subcontractor have provided copies of Lazar's records. Interviews with Lazar's former co-workers confirmed that he did work on sensitive projects, including SDI research involving this massive particle accelerator. If so, he must have had a security clearance, but trying to track that down has also proved difficult, even with the help of Nevada Congressman Jim Bilbray. For months, Bill Bray's office has been playing postal patty cake with several government agencies concerning Lazar's record. Bill Bray's staff has written letter after letter to the Navy, CIA, FBI, and other agencies 
requesting files on Lazar. The agencies aren't saying they have no such files. They say they can't find them or are still looking. The FBI, the world's greatest detective agency, has spent almost five months searching its own records, but is still looking for Lazar's file. Lazar insists he was investigated by the FBI, not only for his Los Alamos clearance, but also for his work at S-4. It, at one time, three came to the house. One sat me down, started talking to me while the others kind of ran around the house doing things. I have a little lab in the house, and they wrote down everything. I was on the blackboard. They wrote down any chemicals and things that I had in, in the room uh, and just kind of ran all over the place. Lazar says he wrote down the name of one of the agents, Mike Thigpen. The Las Vegas FBI office says no Mike Thigpen has ever worked here. However, an informed source at the FBI says Thigpen was here for a period, that he worked for a separate division of the Bureau, came in, did a job, and left. What that job was, the source didn't know. Lazar is as much to blame as anyone for the difficulties in proving his story. He is admittedly careless when it comes to paperwork, like some absent-minded professor. When his first wife died more than five years ago, he says he walked away from everything. A house full of furniture, pictures, papers. In addition, he's done things in his life that do not help his credibility. For a time, he designed and raced incredibly powerful jet cars. He hung out with rock stars and helped produce record albums. And he and his first wife had an interest in a legal brothel. That interest eventually led to some work he did for a small bordello in a residential Las Vegas neighborhood. When you add it all up, Lazar says he's an easy target to discredit. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of, you know, odd things that I've been involved with over the time, just because I have a, a wide variety of interests. Uh, a lot of it can be misconstrued and, you know, taken out of context, and uh, I'm sure it can be used to make me look, look pretty bad. And, you know, there again, maybe that's one of the reasons uh, they looked at before hiring me. I'm an easy person to, to hammer into the ground. You know, you can take... Uh, any one of a million things. And Most people, Lazar says, have been very supportive of his decision to come forward. And then there's the UFO community. Lazar's testimony hit the UFO field like a tidal wave. For instance, this is an international computer network called Paranet. More than 20,000 people from all over the world are hooked into the system, and Bob Lazar is one of their favorite topics. They share information about his background, debate his allegations, and theorize about his motives. And actually, there was... Uh, there was international coverage of what was going on here the very first day, you know, after the special was run. What we're really pressing for and what we're watching for is more empirical evidence that we can, that we can work with. One item that popped up on Paranet is this supposedly official briefing dated February 1990 that states Lazar did work on the test range, but that he was never allowed inside the, quote, advanced systems test area. The statement says Lazar is merely out for media attention and that all further inquiries should be handled by Nellis Public Affairs. Nellis officials told us that the briefing wasn't written by the Air Force and that they have no information on Lazar. Various UFO experts have also been beating a path to Las Vegas to talk with Lazar. Dr. Jacques Vallée, an astrophysicist, computer scientist, and author, wanted to find out for himself if Lazar is believable. He seems very credible. I think that he was in the places that he described. Uh, he also seemed to have concern with remembering parts of the things that went, went on there. Uh, he seemed to, uh, if you remember, we asked him if, if he felt that his memory might have been tempered with. Uh, now, that is, is something that I think should be of concern as we explore his story. Could it be that he was exposed deliberately to certain things, uh, perhaps to distract attention from, from other things? And, uh, but I, I'm certainly of the opinion that he's not lying, that he's telling the truth, and that he's genuinely concerned with uh, finding out what happened to him. Vallée believes it is possible that Lazar's memory was tampered with, adding that U.S. intelligence agencies have been experimenting with mind control techniques, including drugs and brainwashing, for decades. Lazar has stated previously that he was drugged and subjected to intense intimidation tactics. Vallée's statements are also consistent with the results of Lazar's polygraph tests. My personal thoughts, the pre-test interview of three and a half hours, the test itself, the post-test interview, showed absolutely nothing to detour my thought that Bob Lazar was truthful. Unfortunately, we're dealing with a subject matter here to where fear on uh, behalf of 
Mr. Lazar, of reprisal might far exceed uh, just the threat of losing his credibility as a scientist, which would make polygraph maybe totally ineffective. Lazar was credible enough for the Nippon TV network. Nippon devoted two hours of prime time to a special on Lazar and UFOs in March. The network planned to fly Lazar to Japan so he could appear live following the documentary. But those plans fell through when Lazar received a phone call from his ex-boss at S4. The day we were supposed to go, had tickets in hand, even went down and bought yen down at the uh, uh, currency exchange. Uh, you know, we got threatening phone calls, I mean, that, that basically said, you'll never make it back here. So we really sat down and just thought, how important really is the interview, and we didn't go. And frankly, they don't operate like that. How do they operate? I mean, what... Uh, they tend to feed uh, information into the system through people that they know will repeat it, without questioning it. Bill Moore is something of an expert on the government's anti-UFO tactics, and he's clearly skeptical about Lazar's story. He thinks Lazar may be part of a government disinformation campaign, either willingly or unwittingly. Moore's suspicions have been heightened by Lazar's unwillingness to open up parts of his private life to public scrutiny. Lazar says he doesn't care whether UFO people believe him or not, and that he doesn't want to have his background picked apart. Even though he's done things in private that might seem strange, he says he stands by his original statement. The, the job I had, the involvement with uh, you know, the government cover-up, that sort of thing, the story isn't altered in, in any way. I mean, that stands as fact, and that's the bottom line. Is government disinformation for real? Is there an S-4? Is there a connection between UFOs and stealth technology? More on these topics tomorrow. George Knapp, Eyewitness News 8.